Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to Answers, Special Education in the COVID-19 Era. I'm your host, Kevin Daly. In this edition of Answers, there will be an update with the latest information about special education. There will be an update to Mommy School with advocate Audra Talbot. My guest today is clinical psychologist Adrian Smaller of Madison. And of course, there will be time for questions and answers with participants. So get ready to mash that Q&A button. We'd like to hear from you. And I'd like to leave enough time to answer as many questions as possible. So feel free to start writing. Answers is brought to you by PATH, Parent to Parent Family Voices of Connecticut. For over 30 years, the nonprofit PATH has served families of children with special health care needs. It has many programs and services, and they're not just all about special education. For more information about PATH, please visit the website, pathct.org. If you have any questions about today's presentation, please send me an email. My email address is kdaily at pathct.org. A word about this webinar. This webinar shouldn't be taken as legal advice or as healthcare advice. It's really just a production by a special education advocate who's been around for a while, who finds himself asking more questions than ever before. And I'm hoping to get answers. That's what I plan to share with you. And now the school update for April 21st, 2020. We'll start with something we already know. Governor Ned Lamont has suspended schools and closed schools until May 20th at the earliest. This affects about half a million special education, uh, half a million students, and about 70,000 of them are special education students. By executive order of the governor, the 180 day rule has been suspended. This is a rule that requires schools to be in session for at least 180 full days of school. That is no longer the case, and schools can have fewer than 180 days of school this year. However, like all years, the last day of school will be no later than the last day of June. The Connecticut State Department of Education has issued some directives to schools that they have to follow. And in their guidance, they have encouraged schools to provide continued educational opportunities for their students. They also direct schools to call it distance learning. And by now, many people who are watching this webinar are quite familiar with distance learning. Also from the State Department of Education, Schools are directed to ensure special ed students have access to these opportunities, to these learning opportunities. Equal access is the goal. And schools should also maintain consistent communication with parents. And folks, in, in my experience from talking with many, many parents, these things are happening. I know of schools that are in regular touch with uh, parents, parents that I know, um, and their staff, including their special ed staff, has been available to modify work, make accommodations as necessary. It's not exactly special education, but it is something that helps students, our kids, access the distance learning opportunities. Although there are some times that it doesn't work out, that's for sure. More guidance from the State Department of Ed. A continued educational opportunity day is not considered a school day. And, and this, this is a pivotal point in many ways. It's considered a learning day. So when your child is doing distance learning, whatever its form is, it can be paper assignments that are brought home and sent back to school, can be medium tech like a telephone or high tech like a web-based uh, conference. It's not a learning day. It's, a, it's not a school day. It's considered a learning day. 
And in this complicated statement that you see in front of you from the US Department of Education, it contains another directive for schools. This directive tells schools that they should get distance learning in place. And if it doesn't comply with IDEA or any of the laws that protect our kids, that's okay, go ahead and do it anyway. Which may seem rather callous, However, this same agency has ruled that once school resumes, schools have to provide special education and related services to students with disabilities. So how does this affect special education students? Well, for one thing, a learning day activities may not comply with IDEA and other laws protecting children with disabilities. They may or they may not. I know school people who are making a big effort to try to comply with special education and try to provide it as well as they can, but these activities may not comply with IDEA. Your, resu your results may vary. Also, schools should ensure that students with disabilities have access to these learning day activities. From what I hear from parents, they are doing that. Um, and in some cases, they're doing an outstanding job of it. In other cases, a uh, less than outstanding job of it. I'm thinking of the parent who told me about her daughter, who has a visual impairment, who through distance learning was given an assignment to watch a video. Now that's not really making it uh, available and giving equal access to this child, uh, but the parent got in touch with the school they were able to work it out, so it wasn't a problem. The bottom line here is that when school resumes, special education will resume, and while school people are doing their best to try to support kids with disabilities, it's not really special education, not as we remember it back before things got crazy. More guidance from the State Department of Education. Special education evaluations are suspended, and also timelines that involve a certain number of school days have been suspended as well. An example of timelines like this are the 45 school day timeline that goes between the initial evaluate, the, the initial PPT meeting for someone who's going through the referral process, the referral PPT to the identification PPT, that 45 day timeline does not apply. Neither does the timeline when a parent requests their child's school records, if it's a special education parent, and they put the request in writing and ask because they need it to prepare for a PPT meeting. At one time, the parent, that parent could get the records within five school days. That's another timeline that has been suspended. Schools are getting even more direction, this time from OSERS, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. According to OSERS, when schools resume their normal operations, IEP teams must make an individualized determination whether and what and to what extent compensatory services may be needed. And there you have it from the US Department of Education. Compensatory services may be needed. They may be needed because our kids may regress, regress more than typical students do during this time when, student, when schools are closed. So what does this mean? What does this mean? It means that there will be a time. There will be a time when PPT meetings will be held again, held to assess the impact of the school closures on every special education student, every student with a disability. It tells me that PPT teams will develop appropriate compensatory strategies and services to meet a uh, individual student's needs. It also tells me that parents need to start preparing now for when PPT meetings will be held. What we need to do is keep a running record of your, our, our children's progress while they are conducting distance learning. So what does this all mean? How do we bring it all together? And these days, everyone is looking for a way to link this current crisis to something that's already happened. 
uh, so it will be easier to understand, linking it to the September 11th tragedy or World, World War II or World War I or the original Spanish flu epidemic in, in 1918. Everyone's doing that. And so if you'll bear with me, this is my turn. This is how I look at things right now. Right now, special education is like a ship that's lost at sea with a huge storm bearing down on it. The ship is being rocked back and forth in danger of sinking and things don't look good. You know, when that happens on a real ship, it's not business as usual. It's all hands on deck and no matter what your rank is, no matter what your job is, that stops. And instead you do things like pump the pumps, drain the bilge, make sure the sails don't tear, do whatever it is sailors do to make sure the ship stays afloat. Folks, this is where we are right now with special education. We are caught in a storm. That storm is blowing us off course. And until that storm is over, and we really haven't reached the peak yet, it's all hands on deck. We need to keep the ship afloat. School people need to keep learning going as well as they can. One thing about storms, including the current storm that we're in that's caused by the pandemic, they eventually clear, eventually the skies brighten, and eventually there comes a time when the fight to keep the ship afloat has, has been won. And you can do things like plan how to get to the destination now that you've been blown off course. It's time to take the map out and see what it will take to get to the destination. Now, it may take longer to go. It may take more effort and it may require some hardships, but eventually the ship of special education and public education will be going again. And eventually that ship will reach its destination. The problem is that it's right now. We're not there yet, but have faith. We will get there. And be prepared. Parents need to be prepared for the day when we go to PPT with school people. We need to be prepared to collaborate. And to school people, what matters most is data. Parents need to be gathering data on their child's progress and performance. Audra is going to have more on that in a second, and Adrian Smaller is going to tell us more about that too. This just in, something you already know, uh, according to the State Department of Education, PPT meetings can be held while schools are closed if both parties agree to it. Um, and you can expect if that happens, it will be done by an alternative means like a video conference or a conference call. There are parents who have reported that their school district is steadfast in refusing all requests for PPT meetings. I've talked with parents, heard from them by email. Uh, I know one town in Northwest Connecticut where I've heard from three different families where they've been told no PPT meetings till the kids are back in school. And this is according to direction from the State Department of Education which of course is contrary to that. Um, last week, and this is the breaking news, last week a group of advocates and parents went to another state agency, the Office of the Child Advocate. And these advocates and parents complained about the fact that school districts were denying PPTs to parents. They had conversations with these advocates and parents. The OCA learned what happened, and there was a concern there at OCA about no PPT meetings. So OCA spoke to state officials, as the report goes, and that does sound vague, I have to admit that, but this is a report from the OCA. They spoke with state officials. Those state officials agreed that no parent should be told that a school district will not hold a PPT meeting. So now, clarifying and updating guidance is going to be coming from the State Department of Ed Education on a parent's right 
to have a PPT meeting. This is something that it says it was coming next week. This is from last week's report from OCA. So we're talking about this week. Uh, up until my five o'clock deadline today to provide the latest news, that guidance had not materialized. If it does within the next week, I'll have a full report for you on the next edition of Answers. In other news, everyone's heard about the CARES Act and how it was passed a few weeks ago. The CARES Act is the $2.3 trillion dollar stimulus package that was passed by Congress to get the economy going again after the crisis that we're in. The CARES Act has money for schools, some nice money for schools to help schools keep their teachers, to help schools keep, keep their non-certified staff like paraprofessionals. Folks, if, if these people go on to other vocations or jobs in other places, schools will lose them. It's important to retain teachers and staff in schools or else when schools open up <laughs> there will be no one to go back to. The CARES Act also directs the U.S. Secretary of Education to come up with waivers, waivers to the laws that protect our children, waivers on IDEA and other laws. Now what is a waiver? According to Merriam-Webster Online, a waiver is an uh, act of intentionally relinquishing or abandoning a right, claim, or privilege. It's also the legal instrument evidencing such an act. So what I get out of this is these waivers that are going to be proposed to Congress, waivers that Congress will have to approve, they're not automatically approved, waivers that Congress will have to approve, these waivers, the intention is to relinquish or abandon our children's rights. There are people who take a very dim view to that, and there are some people who even question whether that can be done at all. Now, the CARES Act does have a lot of waivers, not just educational waivers in it. There is a waiver that suspends foreclosure and eviction on federally backed mortgage loans. There is a waiver that cancels student loan payments until September of this year. Also cancels interest on those loans until September. There's even a waiver that allows people to take money from their IRA retirement accounts without the 10% penalty that usually applies. So people will have access to more money. So waivers can be benevolent, benevolent things. They really can and they can help However, many, many questions, many questions about the waivers to the laws that protect our children. For example, how, feel, how far will the waivers go? Will these waivers be used as a way to make permanent reductions to special education? And folks, this is a very real, real possibility. There are people who are inside the Washington Beltway who are no friend to special education or public education at all. So will it be that way? Or will these waivers be reasonable considering the extent of the crisis? You know, considering how far we've been blown off course and how far it takes to get back on course and get to our destination. Will the waivers provide flexibility? The flexibility schools need in order to get back to business quickly and efficiently? Folks, we just, just don't know. We're at a period where we're waiting for the waivers. Until the waivers come out, there are all kinds of things we can speculate, but the fact is, when it comes to what's in the waivers, we won't know. We'll know when we see the waivers, and we won't know until then. Until then, I suggest doing what the great American author and playwright, James Thurber suggested, don't look back in anger, don't look forward in fear. It's very easy to do both of those. Instead, look around in awareness. By looking around in awareness, we learn, and that's the best way to prepare for the future, whatever it holds. On the next edition of Answers, on April 28th, 2020, 
my guest will be special education attorney Piper Paul. I hope you can join us at 6 p.m. on Tuesday next week. Now it's time for an update on Mommy School with advocate Audra Talbot. Great. Well, thank you for that report, Kevin. It's always very informative and I appreciate it. Um, and welcome everyone to back to Answers and I'm gonna bring you right into Mommy School so we can get to our speaker. Um, I wanted to do a different spin this week. Um, I've been talking to a lot of parents, good friends of mine, other mothers with children with special education and it seems like we're all worried about the same things. So I wanted to share that with you to let you know that you're not alone. And I think that's one of the most important things to help us keep going as parents because it comes from us and it filters down into our kids. So the top five worries for parents. And again, mommy, my goal of mommy school is addressing your feelings. And it, there is so much fear and hopelessness and hopelessness that's being circulated around. And I just think if this is a little ray of sunshine to help you get through the next week, then so be it. We've accomplished that goal. And, and I am a true believer that knowledge brings confidence. And when you have the confidence because of your subject matter and your knowledge of that, it gives you the empowerment to go into your meetings and to carry on and do what you need to do for your children. Next slide, please. So our top five worries. I polled all of my friends as we were doing a Zoom happy hour a couple um, nights ago and also text messaged and you know went on and kind of interviewed them a little bit. Number one was regression. Everyone is worried about regression regardless of what the disability is. Everyone is worried about the same things and you need to know that. So I'm going to go in to the next slide. Regression is the biggest worry among parents. Sorry, misspelling there. And you know I think what's important Kevin, can you hear me? There you go. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so that's our biggest worry is regression. And what we talked about on our, our Zoom happy hour was what we can do about it. And I said, you know, you can collect data. And we had a, a whole segment before about collecting data. So I'm happy to share that again with anyone that needs it. It's really important to collect data. And Kevin had said that. And I'm sure Dr. Small will talk about it too. Um, another really good thing to help maintain is the learn strategies from your teachers that are delivering services. Um, I do it every day. I have a session with a special ed teacher to learn strategies. It works really well. Um, cause they're teaching me cause I'm not a teacher by any means. Um, I'm asking for help a lot more, which is teaching me to be humble and I'm sharing my concerns, which I always do anyway. Um, and then also discussing what services we need right now to help supplement my son and my daughter and it's outside services. It's in school services. Yes. I, I accept that we're going to have to do more later, but what do we need right now? to halt our regression if we can halt it. Next slide, please. The second, the second concern was the uncertainty of the unknown, which I think for all of us, that's the anxiety provoking component to this. So what we don't know about the future is, that's a basis of human, I think, human nature. But what I've learned over the years is I expect it. And when I do that, I'm prepared for what will come. And if, if something bad doesn't happen, then so be it. It doesn't happen. That's a good day. Um, what you can do about the uncertainty, if you have those feelings and that's, you know, manage your own anxiety. Because I'm a believer, being a mother of two children, a, a special ed kids that are very high need kids, a single mom, managing my anxiety really helps them manage their anxiety. Um, refocusing the conversation, a lot of conversations from my daughter about her fears and refocusing her is really important. Doing that just seamlessly, practicing. I practice a lot with that. 
um, we actually go out and do something fun. And of course, we're practicing social distancing. I don't bring them to anywhere that would be unsafe for them. But, you know, we go out and we go in the woods and we hike and we do, you know, we go around our neighborhood. So getting out of the house and a change of scenery seems to be working for them and for me too. It's healthy, mental health wise. And we don't school all the time. We do the majority of our work in the morning. And if we can't get it done, we do our best, of course. But if we can't get it done, then we move on and we go to our next day. And no one's going to die if you don't do all your work during the day. And I think that's really important to remember. No, slide three, please. The next slide, number three. So uh, another concern that a parent shared with me this is her social isolation and her son's social isolation. This is a huge worry that social skills will regress because of the social isolation. This is everything we don't want for our kids and it's happening. And how do we, what do we do? Um, some things we talked about and I talked about with our providers was setting up an online chat, a safe room, chat room. You know, nothing that is dangerous for my daughter because she doesn't have the wherewithal to know if it's dangerous. But, you know, something pre-screened by myself. I asked the teacher about setting up a lunch bunch. So we do that every Monday. A very small group of maybe three to four kids with the teacher running the Zoom chat or the Google Meet. And it works really, really well. And she looks forward to it. Um, a buddy check-in is something we do with my son, who is not as verbal, but he still has communication. So we do a buddy check-in. I do it with a friend of mine, and we both have sons that are a, a lot of the same needs. Um, the school does it as well. And we joined an online interest group. So there's an interest group for my daughter. It's my, uh, Minecraft. That was something she really had an interest in. So she talks to people about it. There's a Harry Potter interest group that she joined. So she's chatting safely with other kids. And, you know, she's going through a potions class online. And she gets to chat with other kids that are interested in things she's interested in, which is not a common thing for her. Um, number four. Uh, number four concern was the increased anxiety and the increase of behaviors. And so the emerging behaviors in our house are all over the board. Um, what can you do about it? Well, you talk to the school. That's why they're there. The school is there to support you. You utilize the resources such as the counseling and the check-ins, especially the counseling component. If that's something that you already have in the IEP, that's something you should be, be accessing and if you have a problem accessing it you need to talk to them about why and how you can get that done um what we do is we access our behaviorist our bcba we have a private one and we also have one through our the school um these are your subject matter experts on behavior they can give you tips they can show you how to collect data your abc data which i discussed before um it is imperative that you have a behaviorist part of your team and if that's on your IEP, you access it. Again, it's, you know, it's part of what should be happening if you have behaviors, increasing behaviors. Um, think about what outside providers can do to help identify the triggers. So we have a, a team of medical providers. So I've tapped into them a lot and have private conversations on the phone with them. And then when we do our telehealth appointments, they're able to kind of um, ask the questions that need to be asked in order to get the answers from my, my daughter about this. So that's really, you know, it's beneficial, the telehealth for us. Um, and asking for help for data collection from the school, I think is really great. But it's, you have, to, again, having the behaviorist or someone, or the school psychologist is also well-versed in behaviors and collecting data. And, you know, helping, having them help you come up with a behavioral plan for home. I have one. We had to just recreate one that we already had. And it changes weekly. So that's another thing. Next slide, please, Kevin. Um, one that kind of caught me by surprise, the number five worry was not knowing enough. Um, I agree. I, I have that feeling sometimes um, of not knowing enough. It's, you're, you're, it's almost like you're sprinting a marathon 
constantly as a parent with a kid with special ed. Um, you can't beat yourself up over it because you're, you're, not the, you're not a teacher by trade. You can't know everything all at once, but you, have to, you do have to learn parts of this. But you can only do the best you can. Um, so what can you do if you have that feeling of not knowing enough? I asked for a parent-teacher session. And so without my son being involved, I had, I had one today, a parent-teacher session, because I was stuck on something um, about reading a story and how, did, how do I get him to answer questions about reading comprehension? And she just had the answer just like that. It was amazing to me. It was something I hadn't thought of because I'm not a teacher and I don't teach special ed. Um, and another thing that was really important that this particular special ed teacher said to me, she said to meet your child where they currently are at the present moment. I use that phrase in PPT meetings as an advocate. You need to meet the child where they are, but it really applies in the situation. They're, they're stressed out. They're anxious. You know, they're, they're not accessing what they normally would be accessing for their curriculum. And we need to meet them where they are. Um, you're not expected to be a teacher and an OT and an SO, a speech and language pathologist and a behaviorist. You're not expected to do that, and you should not be expecting yourself to be doing that. You're a parent, and that is your first job. Um, next slide, please, Kevin. So I like to say what I learned each week, because I literally learn something new each week. <laughs> it's amazing to me. So what I learned this week was, how do I fo following their lead, bribery is, you know, it's not beyond me. I bribe them for everything now, because that's how I get stuff done. And I give them a little control to get what I need accomplished. And it works. And I, I learned something, I need to be more adaptable. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of my son with maple syrup on Percy, the train. And um, I think it's really important to note that he has, <laughs> he has my blessing to do this. And he was telling me a story. He loves to retell stories. And he just wasn't available to do any of the speech stuff we were working on. So I made it into a session. I took out the syrup from the refrigerator. And, he, and we put it in a bin so it was contained because <laughs> that would freak me out if it was all over my kitchen. But we talked about how Percy was covered in the maple syrup and what color Percy was. And we made it into a whole learning session. Um, so my point to tell you this is just follow what they're doing. You have to gauge it. If it's on the floor, get on the floor. If, um, you know, it's about syrup, just use the syrup. It was something I learned very early on. It's something called floor time. And so I'm taking pieces of that and infusing that into my teaching. Next slide, please. So the bribery part. Yeah, I'm not beyond that. So I'm, it's pretty much whatever you want, kid, you can have it. So we were teaching less and more. And I was really getting frustrated because I know he knows this. And I couldn't get him to, to tell me which was more and which was less. And he was frustrated with me, too, because he actually slapped me. So I had a session with a special ed teacher and she told me how to set it up. And I have a piece of paper that says A and a piece of paper that says B and we use them and M's. And so I used what he wanted in order to teach this concept and it worked. And he's actually flying like an eagle about this. Next slide, please. This is a picture of something my son wrote and it's CMT's schedule. He I gave him the control of, I gave him a bunch of cards, index cards of the things that we needed to cover during the day. And I said, let's make your schedule. My daughter likes to make his schedule for him as well. Um, but I wanted him to do it because she likes her control also, which I love to give to her because, you know, it helps her with her anxiety. But I thought it would be good for him to make his schedule. And he followed it. And every time we completed something, he had a big smile on his face and he put a check mark. So I think that was a good day. We'll take that one. Um, but I find it decreases my anxiety because they're, again, I'm following their lead. My next slide, you had it, Kevin. <laughs> my next slide is something that I needed to be more adaptable. And it was a humbling moment for me. Um, I just needed to change how I approach them. Like they're not the kind of kids that, you know, we're going to do page five in this book and you're going to sit here and you're going to read this. I needed to be more adaptable 
and flexible. I need to learn how to be a flexible learner, which is a new thing for me too. Um, I had to plan it, my flexibility in the moment, which is hard again. Um, but I had to remember to take a little bit from all the strategies I've learned over the years. And I think that's all of us. Next slide, please. So my last slide, again, I wanna leave you with my silver lining and I'm gonna read it to you. I'm surprised at the things I've learned every day about my children's versatility and resilience. And I'm scared what the future holds, just like you are. But I have to remind myself every single day, I have this great opportunity to give my kids a hands-on learning experience. Because that's exactly what this is. This is an opportunity to get down on the floor and play with your kids and use it as your teaching moment. And above all, I am their first and best teacher. And I want you to remember that. Don't stress yourself out because you can't finish something. You are their first and best teacher. Do what your gut tells you to do. And you're doing a great job and you have to just keep moving forward. So thank you for visiting Mommy School and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Audra. Thank you, and Audra will be joining us again when we do our Q&A session. But right now, I'd like to bring on Dr. Adrian Smalley. Hello, and how welcome. are you? Good, thanks. Uh, Dr. Adrian Smaller is a clinical psychologist, and she has been for over 25 years. She has a practice in Madison, Connecticut. Dr. Smaller is an evaluator, and she frequently does evaluations for schools and also does consult services for schools. Dr. Smaller, welcome to Answers. Thank you, Kevin. This is great. What a wonderful um, service that you're giving to our parents. Um, and this presentation was wonderful. I learned a lot tonight. Great. Glad that you liked it. So I'd like to get some answers from you. Sure. We're now about a month into the school closures. There have been a lot of changes for our kids, special education students. A lot of things for them to adjust to a lot of new things for families to adjust to also. Uh, how do you see this crisis affecting children with disabilities and their families? So, um, Kevin, the way um, I've been thinking about this, um, and certainly in my work with the Yale Child Study Center, um, speaking with colleagues, um, the way we've sort of framed it is that any... Uh, psychological issue, any learning problem, anything that a child has had prior to this has become uh, certainly more serious, more pronounced. Um, the anxiety symptoms that we see in children that I see in my practice, um, that has been exacerbated um, by this crisis. And, um, and this, you know, we need to sort of use ourselves as a gauge. And um, I've been thinking about, my husband and I are talking about, well, every other day. So we have a good day and then we have a not so good day. Um, and that's sort of been the bar. Um, and so with children who have limited self-soothing um, resources, who have limited ability to be self-reflective, um, this, they, they just end up feeling yucky. And so that it really does rely, and I, I feel for all of the parents, that it does rely on parents to be that um, coach for their child, to be their, um, their teacher at this point, um, but also to really closely monitor how they're doing psychologically. Uh, in terms of anxiety, uh, and it comes out in different ways, as you know, um, being a parent, um, where it's um, some children become more withdrawn, some kids begin to act out. Regression is the word of the moment, I think, um, and that we're all regressed, even to the point of being in our sweats from the waist down, uh, in our house slippers. We're all sort of regressed rest. Um, and so that that's certainly what we're seeing in our children. And in our population, um, you know, given the range of disabilities, um, it 
is um, exaggerated. Um, it's certainly magnified for our kids. Um, and it makes these times really challenging because we're also talking about parents who feel overextended, whether it's financially, psychologically, um, and caring for their children and caring for themselves and caring for their parents, uh, elderly parents. Um, so I think that everybody is, um, you know, under um, the sort of dark cloud um, that we're sort of not even sort of midway through at this point. But I'm also encouraged by, um, you know, certainly resources that you're providing that the Yale Child Study Center is providing, that mental health um, colleagues across the state are providing, and learning how to be available uh, by teleconferencing um, and other methods. So I feel like um, we are adapting, and certainly adaptability is the key here. Um, but it certainly is a very heavy burden on parents, um, and I'm hearing that parents are quite stressed. They certainly are. Now, some parents tell me that distance learning is working for their child. Some parents tell me it isn't working. I actually had one parent of a special ed student tell me it was working better than it was in school before the craziness started. Mm -hmm. But her, her child, um, his, his difficulty was work avoidance. Uh, mm -hmm very intelligent young man, but work avoidance was a, a problem for him. He loves computers and at home learning with a computer <laughs> with, with mother nearby to supervise <laughs> his, his, his attention. Uh, he's actually made great gains. He mm -hmm. has. Um, but I also hear from parents who tell me that it, it isn't working, that they have difficulty getting their child to engage for whatever reason, sometimes it's attention, usually it's the reason that made them eligible for special education right. in the first place. Uh, Dr. Smaller, what would you say to a parent who tells you that their child is not engaging in distance learning and they don't know what to do? So I, um, I'm, making, I'm sort of thinking about the group of patients who love the computer and would just rather be on the computer for the rest of the, and it sort of does work for them, and that's great. But um, but for other kids, it's tedious. It's, um, you know, repetition. Uh, they don't want to sit. They don't want to do it. Or it's, there's certainly a variety of um, how this is done from sort of worksheets that are, have been sent home to, you know, sort of looking at websites and um, looking at some of the computer programs. And it's very difficult for kids to stay engaged. And I sort of, depending on the age of the child, but I sort of look at it and what I've talked to parents about is that when we talk about um, home, homebound instruction in the state, we've had a number of kids who've required that for different medical reasons um, or psychological reasons or waiting for a placement, it's two hours a day. So I'm just trying to sort of get parents to sort of think about if you can eke out two hours a day, that's all that's required for homebound instruction. Um, I was talking to a colleague um, on the patient unit at the Child Study Center, and their length of their school day is no more than two hours a day. So I sort of use that as a benchmark and sort of let parents know that they're not the teacher, that they don't have to be this taskmaster, that you try to, I like Audra's way, I'm a firm believer in bribery. That's awesome. And to really sort of look at this as sort of a minimal experience of just keeping their brain sort of working, keeping some concepts alive, um, and just doing stuff for practice. So I feel like um, we can get, we don't have very much control over our life right now. And I feel like parents wanna have some control over the distance learning. 
And I need everybody to sort of ease up a little bit because it doesn't help parents' mental health either at this point. And that's important because as parents, if we are not taking care of ourselves, it's even harder to take care of our children. That's right. That's absolutely right. Um, because the stress is, you know, the stress is up here. And, um, and I'm certainly a firm believer in schlock time with my kids, you know, whether that's watching a Netflix video or going on a silly scavenger hunt or walking outside or playing, whatever it is. Um, it's those moments that um, being, having this time, the flip side of that is sort of having this time with our children that we would never have had before. And so it has to be a sort of a designated time of school and to sort of recognize that everybody's gonna regress. That's gonna be it, everybody's gonna regress. And that when this is over, we'll sort of pick up and that the routine again will resume and things will be more predictable. But right now, I think just sort of doing the minimal and the best that you can. Let's talk about regression a little bit more because it, it's a given in education yes. that students, all students regress when they're away from school. Our kids, the special education students, some of them tend to regress more than others. And some of these students take an awful long time to catch up once school comes back into session. And this is one reason why we have extended school year programs, ESY programs, also known as summer programs for special education students. Uh, one, one of several reasons for giving a special education student uh, ESY program is to ensure they maintain the progress that they made during the school year and that it transitions over into the following school year. But now we're in a situation where our children are not in school. Dis distance learning is going on, but not all of them are, uh, not all of our kids are engaging in it as well as others. Uh, what are you seeing, Dr. Smaller? Are you seeing signs of regression in the children that you work with? Um, I am. Um, and, um, you know, and who knows what the summer is going to bring in terms of everyone is worried about the extended school year services. Um, many of that's decided at the PPTs that should be occurring right now, whether a child's eligible for extended school year services. Um, it, I, particularly with our population, I usually strongly recommend extended school year services. I have the data in terms of children regressing. Um, but as you know, Kevin, the minimal of extended school year services is usually four weeks, you know, four times a, a, a week. And it's usually two to three hours a day. So it's not a lot. It's not a lot. And that's sort of been our norm. That's sort of our baseline. Um, so I feel that, you know, it's, there's going to be regression that's going to occur. Um, and it occurs naturally, even if you have extended school year services, kids only attend through July, and then there's a month off, and then they start back to school. And so the, the curriculum goes back and starts to again. And that's really what the educators are going to have to begin to do, really sort of look at where they were before this crisis. So um, um, it's not like people are going to jump in and think that they're beginning fifth grade in September. Um, and so I think that we have to really adjust that it's not just happening at this school or Connecticut, it's the world at this point. So we're all going to have lost this time. Um, and the best that we can do is to try to um, participate in the um, distance learning, find interesting kinds of activities and podcasts and websites and all that you can do in terms of helping kids explore their interests at this point. And just to keep the, the brain sort of moving and exercising at this point. So um, I'm trying to just 
um, reassure people that everyone is in the same boat. You know, nobody's ahead of the game here. Sure, but the important thing is to keep learning going as yes. much as possible. Yes. And, and for parents, when the day comes when we PPT and we need to document to the school people how much regression there has been, we need yes. to provide data and we need to have an ongoing record that records every development, every success, right. every lack of success. It's important. Absolutely, absolutely. And the documentation is great. And um, just in terms of um, how Audra talked about it, I'm always um, the, pers for the person who says the parent is the expert on their child. The parent knows their child the best. And um, so their ability to describe and to really sort of keep notes and it doesn't have to be, um, you know, in, you know, in any way that's overburdened, you know, burdensome to parents, but to really sort of keep a log in terms of where your child is and what they've accomplished and what you're noticing that they've lost at this point. Um, and it's only going to help restart things um, when, when they return to school. That's right. You know, I've always told parents that we parents have information about our kids that school people need. Yes information that only we have that you really have a moral duty to share with school people yes. and that's more true now than ever before right that's absolutely right april break april break yeah. some school districts chose to go ahead with their regularly scheduled april break some school districts chose not to what do you think dr smaller is this a good time for special ed students to go on break so so confusing um even in, in madison I, you know I, I was sort of unaware until i was talking to patients was that because they sort of suspended school for that one week then they didn't have an april vacation so and again this is connecticut there's no uniform way of doing it every school district did it differently um, and so I think, you know, there was a suspension of school, then there was some distance learning, then there was a vacation, and it was just, you know, it didn't make sense at all. Um, but I think that uh, in a way that we're struggling, in a way that I see CNN is struggling with the new technology and that kind of thing, I think that schools sort of needed to pause and figure out what they were gonna do uh, because this blindsided them in a way that it did the world, basically. So I, you know, um, it didn't make sense to me. But then again, I, I was talking to patients, I said, well, aren't you off for April break? And they go, no, we're in school. We're, <laughs> we're doing distance learning. So it was just um, not very uniform across the state, but that's how we are in Connecticut. You know, we're pretty independent across towns and districts. Um, so it certainly didn't make sense, but we're sort of moving on from there. Sure. Like so many things in education and special education, it depends on where you live. That's right. That's right. We're in a time now where evaluations are suspended. I know evaluations are something that you're heavily involved in yeah. as a clinical psychologist. <laughs> yes. um, when the craziness subsides and schools reopen, school people are going to be faced with a mountain of missed evaluations that will need to, to be conducted in some way. Uh, I hear a lot about virtual assessments and the concept of uh, evaluating a child uh, through distance using uh, teleconferencing or, or web meeting. Uh, what's your opinion of this virtual assessment? Is this a good way to start assessing our children? So it's interesting, Kevin, because in the last week, maybe the last two weeks, I've gotten bombarded by Pearson Clinical, the publisher of all the psychological tests, Western Psychological, uh, running webinars. So the last two days, I've been involved um, in um, just watching the webinars. I'm old fashioned. I like to sit with a kid <laughs> and test them. Um, but um, the um, teleconferencing uh, in terms of the testing, uh, virtual testing is 
more complicated than we like to think. Um, and even with our technology, it really depends on what the referral question is, what the disability, what kind of disability we're thinking about, the age of the child. Um, you also have to employ uh, a facilitator in the child's home, probably the parent. Um, there's lots of protection in terms of making sure that everything's done according to standardization procedures. Uh, materials have to be mailed to the parent ahead of time. Um, there has to be sort of a third camera watching the child do it while you're watching, while you're administering the, the child. So it's not sort of an easy thing. Um, I've been testing for a very long time and I'm going to need um, a lot of practice in order to do that. If the referral question is for um, a a 16 year old who needs, um, who has ADHD and needs accommodations uh, for the SATs. And it's a family that I've known for a long time, or I know the student, or I've evaluated her or him before, I could probably start with that person. Um, if we're talking about a seven year old um, child on the spectrum, who displays a lot of behaviors, a lot of difficulty with attention and focus, um, and a lot of breaks and a lot of needs in the testing session, I would not be comfortable doing that in terms of uh, virtual testing. So, um, so it's a new area for me. Um, I'm old fashioned. I do like to sit and be in a room with a child. They've also sent us a lot of information when things start to open up about safety procedures in terms of um, safeguarding the testing material, making sure that everything's clean, washing the materials, um, all of those kinds of um, safety precautions that we should be taking when sitting with a child. So that we're all sort of learning all of that and that's kind of on the horizon. Um, and it's going to be challenging um, for people to, it's almost sort of a retraining to learn how to do that. Um, so it's something that um, I've started to study up on as have my colleagues. We're not doing it yet at the Yale Child Study Center. Um, and um, I do have a backlog of, you know, people who I've scheduled for evaluations. And I'm just sort of saying when things begin to open up, um, you know, I will certainly begin to do that again. Um, and it's a tough go. I'm not sure exactly how the schools are going to handle it in terms of their evaluations. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, the, um, um, in terms of technology and PPTs, I've gotten inf inf um, invitations for Zoom PPTs to be held um, before the end of the school year. So that's sort of up and running. But sitting with a child and sort of doing the testing and knowing how to do it and to do it correctly uh, and to know that we're getting a valid picture of that child um, is gonna take a lot of training. So Dr. Smaller, your opinion on virtual assessment. As of today, um, to put it quite simply, yes, no, or so to put it, I, I feel like um, we need to be fully trained in how to do it. And it depends on the age of the child and the referral question. So, um, so I, I'm not quite there yet. My colleagues are not quite there yet. And, um, and for people who have been doing it for a while, we're sort of still engaged in learning from them in terms of watching webinars and, and that kind of thing and sort of seeing how. So it's something, and, and again, one of the other things that a colleague said to me today was, this is, may just be our first wave. So if they're talking about this sort of increasing in the winter um, and us going back to sort of sheltering in place, um, then we're all by that point going to have to be up and running on um, the virtual assessment because the needs are so great. Something has to be done. 
Yes. Definitely. Uh, and uh, folks, participants who are listening in and watching, please send in your questions. You can do it either through chat or by bashing that Q&A button. We're going to be going to your questions in just a second. But for now, Dr. Smaller, I'd like to hear your opinion about what you would tell family members, a family where someone close to them has been diagnosed with the COVID-19 virus. What do you recommend? I, I, I don't mean healthcare information. I'm thinking more of emotional health. It can be a devastating diagnosis to people who are close. Uh, what do you recommend to a family that has learned that someone close has been diagnosed? So um, I do have a child in my practice, um, both parents affected. Um, the father was not uh, diagnosed because he couldn't get a test. The mother did get a test and she tested positive. Um, and um, it's, can be overwhelming for, uh, and this is um, an adolescent, a young adolescent, um, and it can be overwhelming for children. Um, um, she and her um, brothers were sort of left alone on Easter because both parents were quarantined in separate rooms um, and um, talked to her parents through FaceTime. Um, and it was, um, you know, very, very upsetting. Um, but I feel like um, we need to talk about that honestly with, um, with our children, um, labeling the vi virus as a virus um, that makes people sick. Some people get sicker than others. Um, but also sort of talking about we have wonderful doctors and scientists who are really working on this problem. Um, and that um, people in our community are doing the best that they can. Um, and we want to make note of a child's developmental stage in terms of how we talk about this to young children, how we talk about this to adolescents. Um, and, you know, honesty is sort of the best policy uh, in terms of talking about what the symptoms might be, what that person his prognosis is, and that there's a range of symptoms, and that we have to say some people do get very sick. Um, but I think that um, kids want the information, they're connected, they hear things, you want to know what they've heard, what they understand the virus to be, and what their concerns are first. Um, and once you have a good sense of that, then you can sort of um, get your explanations out and also to certainly be reassuring. Um, but it's, um, it's a crisis like we've never really seen before. And so it's sort of uncharted territory. But I feel that honesty um, and, um, and really sort of laying it out for our, our kids with a lot of reassurance that they're going to be okay and that we're practicing sheltering in place, we're doing the best we can in terms of hygiene, we have the best doctors, those kinds of things really start to reassure um, children. And so um, um, it, we're all doing the best we can, I think. I think we are. And what I'm hearing from you, Dr. Smaller, is that when it comes to talking with children uh, about the virus, if someone close has been identified with it. Uh, what I'm hearing from you is that honesty is the best policy, and at the same time, considering that what the child is able to process and, and handle, as opposed to covering it up or pretending right. that it that it doesn't exist. There. Right, right, that's right. Okay, well, folks, in a second, we're going to open it up to questions and answers. I'm going to bring Audra back, too. So if you have any questions for Audra, please put them in chat or hit that Q&A button. Uh, another question for you, Doctor, and this will be my okay. last. At some point, the crisis will be over. At some point, we'll go back to normal, although it will be a new normal. That's what everybody's talking about. You know, there's always a new normal. What was, what was normal 
a year ago is not normal today and what's right. normal today won't be normal a year from now. So there's always a new normal, but there will be a new normal. Tens tensions will ease, schools will reopen. At that point, we'll be able to look back and reflect at this, this whole disaster. I was wondering if you could tell us, is there anything positive you think that we will get from all this that you could share with us? So um, I think what I'm also hearing um, from uh, parents as well as um, children is that this time where our world has been put on pause, that, um, that families are together in a way that they haven't really been. Uh, one mother said to me yesterday, we lead incredibly busy lives. Um, we're in constant movement prior to this, and we've all been with each other um, for richer, for poorer um, kind of thing. But she said, I, given the fact that she and her husband work, um, they never have this opportunity to really be with their children in this way. Um, so I think that, you know, that's, um, that's sort of a, a wonderful blessing in a way. It doesn't mean that it doesn't come with the kinds of stress and strains um, and complaints um, that we're all experiencing as well. But it's certainly an opportunity for kids to look back and say, remember when we went through the virus together? We went on that amazing scavenger hunt. Remember when we watched the entire series of The Office together? You know, so kids are going to really remember this in a way, um, even, you know, when we talk about the hurricanes, kids sort of remember certain fun things that they did when we were all in, you know, um, homebound or powerless because of the hurricanes. One child said to me, well, it's not so bad being at home because at least we have power. So they were certainly remembering a time of Hurricane Sandy where there was no power for days. Um, so I think that, you know, it's really sort of how you frame it with your children and that to sort of look back on these times when the world took a pause, basically. And we had to look for new ways to connect with um, people. And I like um, about the only news I do watch during the day is I tried to turn into um, Governor Cuomo, uh, because I think that he has um, had some wonderful pearls of wisdom um, to share with people. And he says that a crisis makes us better and that we come out of a crisis better for it. And so he's looking for ways that we're gonna all be better together. And so am I. Well, that's what a crisis usually does. It yes. leads to improvement. Yes. Sure. So I'm going to bring back Audra and let's go to some questions and answers. Uh, we have a few that have come in. Audra, are you there? You, I think you need to say something in order for you to appear. I can hear you. Okay. And can we see you? How's that? You, there there you go. Go. Okay. All right. There you go. <laughs> I'm getting this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In, in the questions, we have um, before being quarantined, I had a PPT scheduled with the school that was canceled. Should I be following up with the school and asking for a virtual meeting? Now, this is the kind of question for an advocate. Audra, would you kindly tackle this question? Yes. Um, so I would say yes for the short answer. I would do it in writing because everything's better in writing. Um, I would first start with the case manager, which is the person that is on the front of your IEP, the person kind of in charge of your case. They're called the case manager. Um, if you hit a roadblock for some reason, you go to the next tier. So you're going up the chain of command. So start with a case manager, or when you speak to the special ed teacher, um, hopefully during your distance learning or your virtual meetings, um, bring it up, say, you know, I'm just curious if 
there is going to be a PPT meeting. I had one scheduled and, you know, I think it's important that we have one. Uh, that's, that's how I would proceed. So first in, in writing, have a discussion with them. And what I'm finding is, you know, this is a discussion that we've had throughout the whole or continuous discussion. PPT, some districts are having PPTs, some are, some are not having PPTs. So across the board, you have the right to ask for a PPT meeting. You've always had that right, and that right is still in place, and you need to exercise that right. And please do it in writing so you have documentation that you are asking about this. Um, I should just say that um, uh, um, the P uh, I did receive um, notice of a PPT, but the um, director said if the parent agreed. Yeah. So, um, so I agreed to it. Another evaluator did. And then I just got an email saying the parent did not want to go through with it. She wanted an in-person PPT when school was in session. So again, they're looking for both people to agree to that. Right. Which is important. I mean, yeah. you, we, we absolutely want to have parental participation and not have PPT p meetings right. without parents. Because that does happen when, you know, parents don't have the availability to go in person, can't do it over the telephone. Some districts still have those meetings because they have to do it before the interview review date. Yeah. So that's not, I'm never in favor of that, to no. be honest. No, never. Because parental participation is the number one right you have. Yeah. So it goes both ways. Yes. in this time, post-COVID area. Thank here's you a, for adding that. Here, here's a question from a special education teacher. The teacher writes, I am trying to follow my student's IEP as best I can through Google Meets every day. My kindergarten student is coming undone and has now developed tremendous amounts of anxiety and negative behaviors. The family is in crisis. Should I be stepping back my time and not do as much distance teaching, etc.? I'm worried about the legal ramifications if I don't do my job. Dr. Smaller, how would you respond to that? So, I mean, I, I think that that's um, what I was concerned about uh, in terms of, uh, again, considering the age of the child, considering the anxiety level, um, to sort of make the, to be connected, but maybe to sort of alter what the activity looks like um, and to make it a, a bit more fun um, to so, for the special ed teacher to certainly document that there was an attempt made, um, but this is not meant to create more of an anxiety for this child. And, and also for the family, um, you know, to, to feel like they're in crisis because the child has regressed. So whenever we see a, 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 a regression in our children, that is a, the stress level. And so you really back away from the kinds of demands that you're making on them. Um, and um, this child's letting everybody know that it's too much. It's really too much. That's good to know. This next question is, what about people who have a new diagnosis while all this happened and need an updated IEP for safety reasons before going back to school? These people think, these people need PPT meetings over the phone, I think. And if I could just take a, a stab at that answer and then Dr. Small, Dr. Smaller, Audrey, uh, Audra, I, I'd like you to take a crack at it. Um, of course, you should ask for a PPT meeting. That's important to do. Uh, there is an alternative, however, if everyone is in favor, a IEP can be modified without holding a PPT meeting. This is a strategy that isn't a cure-all. It's not a magic bullet. But in some situations where you urgently need a PPT meeting and it's clear that it's not going to happen, it may be a decent plan B for you. But what do you say, doc Dr. Smaller, to someone who 
has a new diagnosis for their child uh, that happened a after the things got crazy, and they need an updated PPT, uh, an updated IEP for safety reasons. What would you recommend? So uh, um, again, what we were saying is that they, you know, schools are, you just need to put a lot of pressure, like Audrey said, in writing, that they need a PPT. And when we talk about safety reasons, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, is it a placement issue? Is this a child that needs a more restrictive environment? Um, I'm not exactly sure what, um, you know, what they're looking for in terms of the IEP with a child being at home. That is something to consider, isn't it? No, I'm not sure either. So, but absolutely. Um, and, and what I find is that when, it, you know, a parent needs a PPT because they need to know what the program is going to look like. Um, and if they know what the program is going to look like, even if it's going to happen in July, then it helps with the anxiety piece, I think. I can see how it would. Audra, what do you think about this? I'm sorry, you cut out a little. Could you restate the question? Not the whole question, but just the part you want me to answer. Uh, no, let's see. It was about a PPT meeting? Yes, a, a, a parent, uh, a, a child has a new diagnosis that came up after the schools were closed and the parent feels the need for a PPT meeting in order to put protections in place for their child. Um, what would you recommend to that parent? Yeah, so absolutely. Like I think, especially with a new diagnosis, this is a parent that is in uncharted territory. And in, you know, you have to approach it as looking to have the school support you in this time, regardless if we're in lockdown or not, in sheltering place, I'll call it, sorry. I call it lockdown around here. Um, it, again, ask for a PPT meeting, start with a case manager, talk to the special ed teacher, if you even have a special ed teacher yet. With the, you know, I don't know if you even have a plan in place yet. Um, as far as safety, um, I think it's important to have a safety plan first of all, and have a, a good one and not a reactive safety plan, a proactive one. And I think that's really important when we look at behaviors and increasing trauma and anxiety in kids. Um, so that's something that the school psychologist, social worker, behaviorist, your outside people that helped get this diagnosis, you know, we gather your people, create your team, your A team, and get you know, ask the right questions. And, you know, there's, there's resources, there's CPAC as well. And I know the, um, the Bureau of Special Education actually has open phone lines for a specific guidance type question. But I would, you know, I would look to CPAC to ask, you know, if you have a, a question, they will do their best to answer it. And if they can't, they'll find out an answer for you or direct you to someone that can answer it for you. So I think with, as a new parent, I was a new parent once, and then I was a new parent again with both of my kids with, you know, same diagnoses, same, but not so much the same. And right. it's like a learning curve all over again. And you need to have the support of people that are subject matter experts until you, you get into your comfortable zone. But ask for the PPT in writing. That's my moral of the story here. Here comes my son. Sorry. That, that's a good <laughs> idea. Yeah, thank you, Tom. <laughs> So it, here's a question from a parent in Central Connecticut. It's actually two questions. Let's take them one at a time. As an advocate, what are you hearing on how schools have incorporated IEPs or accommodations through distance learning? Dr. Smalling, what have you heard about what schools are doing? It's so variable um, in terms of amount of time, activity. Um, it's just um, sort of from nothing, <laughs> to, you know, from go to this, you know, uh, website, do this computerized program to um, I have a boy with significant um, dyslexia and he's getting 45 minutes, four days a week of Orton Gillingham one-to-one -one on, on Zoom or Google Meet something. I think it's Google, Google Meet. So, I mean, he's getting an intensive program 
Um, and, and then there are other kids who are getting, you know, basically sort of busy work. Um, and so there's such a range. Um, and I can't imagine that very much of this is really following the letter of the IEP. So here's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing the same and there's no, so there's no continuity from district to district and it, and unfortunately it varies with parents' ability to access. Um, there was, when this first all came out, rolled out, there were different phases of it that rolled out. Parents were given Chromebooks. There's some parents that didn't get Chromebooks. Um, and this is this is not just one district. This is statewide and countrywide. Um, parents were trying to access curriculum, Google Classroom on their telephones. That's obviously, the, you know, a terrible situation. How do you, how do you do that? It's just, right. it, it's virtually impossible. So again, I look to the state for their guidance on that. And, and I've got my fingers crossed and my toes crossed that that comes out soon. And I, you know, I'd like, you know, in my wish list, I'd like it to be more specific and having more continuity throughout the entire state of Connecticut. And, right. and being able to, Access. Access is our number one issue, and it always has been, but now it's even worse. Even with socioeconomics, it's not just about that anymore. It's about technology access. Exactly. And Yeah, and um, so that's what I'm hearing. There's, there's no continuity. It's everywhere. Agreed. <laughs> the second half of the question from this parent in C Central Connecticut. I have not heard from my school district since day one. And how can transition meetings be conducted if the kids don't go back? And I believe this is the parent of a child who is transitioning from one school to another, such as middle school to high school. Uh, Dr. Smaller, what, what would you recommend? So um, it's interesting because I just, um, um, just wrote a transitional uh, recommendation. So um, whenever we go back, um, you know, there has to be something put in place prior to that, you know, child's entering whatever the new school is. I have a number of students also sort of transitioning from high school to the college level, and they're supposed to have all of this, all these accommodations and everything sort of in writing. And um, so I don't even know when that's gonna happen. But I think parents have to make noise and get some sort of PPT on board um, prior to the opening of school um, so that that child, um, you know, has met the team and whatever the um, whatever is going to be put into place uh, to make that transition easier. Um, so there has to be there. There are lots of kids in that position who really need to see next year's team, who they're going to be working with, what the classroom looks like. All of that has to be put into place. Um, and um, we, you know, that's just going to have to happen. So parents are going to need to fight for that. Well, it's sometimes just a matter of advocating and advocating very often involves educating the people around the child about what the That's child right. needs until yeah. the child's old enough to do it for themselves. That's and, right. And that does happen. Uh, I, my question for you, Audra, is as an advocate, what would you say to a parent who told you that they have not heard um, from the school district since day one? Uh, so first thing is you know, yes, put it in writing, but th it's time to make a phone call to, I would probably start again with the case manager, but it seems like maybe you've already done that. Um, it's time to go to the special ed supervisor. And if they, if you don't get anywhere with that, then, then a very frank conversation, I think needs to be held with a director of special ed, because that's ultimately the person that makes the decisions. And there is absolutely no reason why a PPT cannot be held. And that's my stance on that. And if a district is telling, and I'm guessing this is probably a, maybe a daily consulting client, I'm guessing. And, um, I think that um, a discussion with a uh, higher up on the food chain needs to happen because I think that this is one of those situations where 
you know, we get into this gray area. How do you define what's an, you know, an emergent reason to have a PBT meeting? What's, what's a reason to have one in this time? Well, I think a reason to have one is planning for a transition because that's a huge life event. It affects every aspect of the student's life and the family's life. And it's having an impact and adversity uh, on this. Um, yeah, so feel free to reach out. Um, I'm happy to help advise. I, I think that that needs to happen, that planning part of it, because we don't know when we're going to back to school. That's how I'm operating right now, is we don't know. We know at least till May 20th. We know that. There's some places in Massachusetts that are saying not till August. And then even beyond, some colleges and universities, from what I'm reading, are even saying beyond that until, like, just calling off the fall semester and doing it all in line and then going back in spring. So we are preparing, this is emergency management. This is kind of my old wheelhouse. This is emergency management. You have to plan for everything that's going on. So I think as you as a parent, we should be planning that you need to have this transition PPT meeting. And you know, going further with that needs to be in writing, number one, golden rule, and then a phone call needs to be made. And I, and it, I, sorry, <clears throat> I find it really hard to believe that a district hasn't reached out at all. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry to hear that. And that's yet another reason why I think it needs to come from us as parents and advocates to reach out now. Definitely. We have time for one more question and it's from our question and answer. Um, what do you recommend as a strategy in dealing with the district for kids returning to the district after several months in a PRTF due to <clears throat> unsafe behavior issues, in our case due to RAD, PTSD, ODD? A lot of acronyms there. Dr. Smaller, I wonder if you could help us with that. What is a PRTF? I, I have no idea. What is that? Audra, do you know? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm get, so I'm going to put a guess out there because there's so many acronyms for so many different things. Like a, ASD is actually a heart problem also, you know, and not just autism spectrum right. disorder. But I'm guessing that it's um, maybe a psychiatric hold or a hospital stay, I'm guessing, maybe. Um, In-house inpatient kind of status. Okay. And then from there into the district and what planning, which a lot of planning, as you and I both know, needs to happen in order for that transition. So yes, again, let's push for at least a PPT meeting. They absolutely can do this virtually. This is why we do this. Absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely a PPT meeting um, with lots of data from the parent in terms of what and also certainly from outside um, mental health person, psychiatrist, um, and um, to really sort of um, um, evaluate where that child is and what needs to be put in, in place and certainly in terms of safety um, mm -hmm. prior to transitioning, whether it's to a psychiatric program or to um, school with a lot of supports. So um, that's where you begin, and it, it should be done. Yeah, agreed. And also revisiting that within a certain time frame that's yes. established at that, that first meeting. Like that's I would great. want to have that, another meeting within okay. a certain time it's so we can look at what, mm -hmm. yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. Okay, and, and I did get clarification from the parent just a second okay. ago. That acronym stands for Psychiatric Residential Treatment Center. So you were right in your assessment of what kind okay. of uh, okay. uh, facility okay. it, it is. And at that point, uh, we are just about out of time. So I would like to thank Dr. Smaller. Th thank yeah. you so much for being here. Audra, yeah, as always. My pleasure. It's Audra. always great to see you, Audra, too. It's always great. It's really a pleasure to see you. She's one of the best, everybody. Just I know. Up. That's why I asked <laughs> you to join. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Really Thank you. Thank you. Everybody stay safe and healthy. And on the next edition of Answers, Tuesday next week at 6 p.m., please join us. My special guest will be special education attorney Piper Paul. Oh, that's until, great. Yeah. <laughs> until then, folks, be well. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Bye.